Hey guys, what is up? It's been a really long time since I've done an actual screencast on this channel, and the main reason is that like most of the rounds have been either during school or just sort of like impossible to do. Like many of these have been on weekdays, for example, um, which makes it slightly hard to do anything. So that's my excuse. <laughs> yeah, so I've been trying to get solutions videos for the ones I can do, and, um, but yeah, I can't record during school. It's slightly weird to do that. So it doesn't work. But for once, I have a day off on a time where there's a round. So this should work. I'm also going to update the sub count for the first time in what seems like years. It's like a full thousand now. Yeah. And yeah, let's do it. Uh, you may be able to tell, I'm not sure that I've gotten a bit sick lately, which is probably going to affect my performance, but whatever, it's not really about that. Alright, create an array of n positive integers such that the sum is divisible by k and maximum omen is minimum possible. So we basically want... Um, okay, so we have a number n and a number k. We want the sum of the elements is divisible by k and maximum and is minimum possible. <coughs> so positive is kind of annoying. Um, so we can create the smallest array we can where we have, um, we have, let's see. So if we let x equals n mod k, then we can have x of, um, I think it's n divided by k floored, and then k minus x of n divided by k plus 1. And then what we get is um, k times n over k because that's in all the terms and we have n of them, plus k minus x, that's it. Um, actually, it should be, what should it be? I mean, it's like n minus x or something? Should help this work. Maybe we need um, maybe we need like this. I think we need this and then m minus x of that. Actually, I'm doing this whole thing wrong. It should be like k over n or something. Um, you yeah, know, that's sort of the common term because we want to create the we want to create exactly k, because that's the easiest thing we can do. And if not, then um, if we can't do exactly k because of the numbers being 0, then we'll go for um, the largest number k that's greater than n. Yeah, because we need k to be greater than or equal to n, otherwise we'll have zeros, and that will be bad. So we can have n minus x of k over n, and then x of k over n plus 1, I guess. So really what it means is, consider some k. Assume k is greater than or equal to n. If not, we'll handle it. And then if k is divisible by n, then the number we get is just k over n. Otherwise, it's not divisible by n. can't draw. And then we get k over n plus 1, or the floor of that plus 1, or the ceiling of k over n. Actually, it would be the ceiling of k over n. So either way, we get the ceiling of k over n because that's the best we can do. We can't have lower because then having lower would make the maximum larger. <clears throat> so I guess that would be it. And if k is less than n, then increase k by like 
like we want the smallest multiple of n that's less than or that's greater than or equal to we want the smallest multiple of k that's greater than or equal to n so x is greater than or equal to n over k so then x is also the ceiling of n over k which is interesting or n over k yeah right yeah um Sure. So first we um, create this number. So it's n plus k minus 1. Then we multiply it by k so we can um, have it like scaled up because we need it to be x times k is greater than or equal to n. So then um, the answer would be ceiling of k over n k minus n plus 1 over n. Ideally, this has been working so far. That would be, that would be nice. Five thousand more. Oh, wait. <coughs> okay, well, that's wrong anyway. So um, what's with that? Oh, because I screwed up the condition. Five one one three. Okay, why? Oh, yeah, because I need to use X. Fancy that. So we first take the smallest multiple of K that's greater than or equal to N because otherwise there's nothing we can do. We can't create a number that's smaller than K while having all the elements be positive because that's not possible. And then using this construction, we can achieve the bound of ceiling k over n, which is, I think, definitely the best we can do. Being a bit slow today, but that's, that's fine. I'm just trying to be stable. OK, so that gives us a. Now we have b. You have a statistic of price changes for one product represented as an array of n positive integers or PO is the initial price, and PI is how much the price was increased during the ith month. So inflation coefficients as the ratio of current price increase to the price at the start of this month. Inflation coefficients. What? <coughs> your boss said you clearly, your boss told you clearly that the inflation coefficients must not exceed K percent. So you decided to increase some values pi in such a way that all pi remain integers and the inflation coefficients don't exceed k percent. The bigger changes, the most the more obvious cheating. Okay. Inflation coefficients. So I guess it would be, I guess it would have to be greedy. Um, let's say we have, okay, this is like a weird statement. So first of all, we can break down the K percent condition into something that works with integers. We want like um, the sum, the sum of all previous PI, I equals zero to like J minus one over pj, j being the current number we're at, to be less than or equal to k over 100. Meaning we can cross multiply to make everything work in integers, like pi. 100 is less than or equal to k times pj. So now that gives us integers. So now we really just need to find um, we need to find the largest value of pj that satisfies this. So again, once again, just like a, we're working with ceilings here. So we have 100 times the sum of pi divided by k. We're just manipulating the equation here. And um, so therefore, pj is the ceiling of this. 
because that's like the definition of ceiling. And there's no other way to make this work other than increasing pj. Because if we were to increase, like say we're at j, if we were to increase something to the left of it, then that would make it so this sum is larger, but this is smaller. Or this doesn't change, meaning that this inequality is harder to satisfy. And if we were to increase it on the right, then it doesn't affect this at all. So the only thing we can do to make this possible is to increase the current pj. Meaning that like. The moves we do are sort of forced. There's no like strategy. We're forced, like for j equals um, like the numbers in increasing order, we're forced to satisfy the current number, even if it makes it harder to do it for later numbers, because there's nothing else we can do to satisfy that current number. So um, that basically does it. Um, so we're basically just going to simulate this, um, and then the current sum equals zero. Please tell me the values can't be zero, please. Awesome. So they're non-negative. Okay. So then um, the lowest possible number we can have to satisfy this is the ceiling value, which is um, Four, no, what? Four. 100 times sum, and then the ceiling of that, so plus k minus 1 over k. And um, so if ai is less than this required value, then ai ants plus equals rec minus ai, that's how much we need to increase, and ai is equal to rec. Then sum plus equals ai, because we need to maintain the prefix sum. <coughs> and if ai is greater than or equal to rec, then it's already big enough, so we don't care. OK, that's slightly wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? Something is slightly wrong here. Um, <laughs> indeed, something is slightly wrong. What, what, what's happening here? Can we mess up the equation somehow? Pj is greater than or equal to that. Oh wait, it's it's all like it's all it's all flopped. It's all messed up. I need to do this, I guess, and then um, move these over. That's not gonna work. Move that over, and then move this over. Is that is that what it is? We need for. I don't understand. The ratio of the current price increase. Oh yeah, okay, I guess that's how it works. All right, I guess we're gonna resolve this. <laughs> Yep, that's what you get for rushing into a problem. So let's just like redo the equation. Um, in fact, it makes it slightly easier. We have p sub j is less than or equal to k times sum of pi over 100.
meaning that now increasing it actually makes it worse. Oh, well, actually, what we can do, I guess, is we want to make this... We can't make this smaller. The only thing we can do is make this larger. And the only thing we can actually affect within this is this sum. <clears throat> and the best way to affect this sum is to do so in a way that doesn't affect this. Meaning that, like, the best thing we can do is do all the changes on P0, because otherwise we have to do some other things that aren't good. I think. So if we do all the changes on P0, then for each individual element, we figure out how much we would need to increase this by. So now we can reformulate the equation to be something like, what does this need to be? i equals 0, j minus 1 of pi. Then that needs to be, come on. Then that needs to be, um, if we solve for stuff, greater than or equal to 100 times pj over k. And then we can find out the amount we'll need to increase this by, and then take the maximum over all the amounts. Because doing it for P0 will increase everything simultaneously, meaning that all we care about is the maximum we need to change by. OK, right. Let's not misread the problem again. That would be ideal. So then, of course, this is just ceiling. Um, OK, sure. So the requirement is equal to um, I assume it ignores the first element because otherwise it's kind of impossible. So 1 up to n, the requirement is equal to the ceiling of 100 times ai plus k minus 1 over k. Um, Right, so now we again take the maximum over the difference between the required and the current sum we have. Because that means we need to increase it by at least that much. Seems legit. Um, let's see, this seems like a pretty exact number. Yeah, seems like it satisfies things. It's being very slow today, this is interesting. All right, longest simple cycle. You have n chains. The ith chain contains of ci consists of ci vertices. Vertices in each chain are numbered independently from one to ci, along with chain. In other words, the ith chain is the undirected graph with ci vertices and ci minus one edges, connecting the jth and the j plus one. Okay, undirected graph. So it's just like a, yeah, sure, that's what it looks like. So you decide to unite chains in one graph in the following way. The first chain is skipped. The first vertex of the first chain of the ith chain is connected by an edge with the ai vertex of the i minus oneth chain. The last vertex is connected by an edge with the bi vertex of the i minus oneth chain. Calculate the length of the longest simple cycle in the resulting graph. Okay, <laughs> fun. Do they have AI as less than, no they don't. <coughs> I 
I see. Okay. So if AI is equal to BI, then the chain is immediately like dead, or the the cycle is immediately dead. Um, if we have something like, so we have something weird like, um, whoa. So so we have something like, let's do some drawing as always. And we want to make sure that, for example, say this links with this and this links with this. Um, and then we get something like that, maybe. So the key is like we need this to not overlap. So for example, we could start here. And then we can say that the first, and then we're going to sort of like go through the cycle, just like literally go through it and see what everything takes. So we first um, start here, start with our pointers here and here. And then um, I think we can't go both left and right. Or can we? Wait. I think we'll assume we'll only go left, because if we were to also go right, then we would find this cycle by coming from the right rather than explicitly going right. Um, so that kind of makes it work. So we'll sort of like sweep right, and then if we ever hit a point where we're forced to like stop the cycle, then we can reset it. Are AI greater than two? I, I would bet they aren't, because why not? Okay, yes, they are at most. They are at least two. That's good. So then, um, hmm. yeah, so then if we ever hit a point where we're like forced to reset our cycle, like for example, if we have um, both things that converge to a single point, then we would cut the cycle short and then restart from the next point. And this works because again, if we ever assume we need to go right, then we can instead go left from the right point and to get the same thing. So then basically, I guess it just becomes greedy, like or just like simulating it. So we go across. If we ever hit the same vertex, we're done. Otherwise, we traverse until we get to the endpoints, and then now we have two vertices at, at the endpoints, and so now we continue. Um. Yeah, that seems legit. Sure. And then we also consider the case where at every point we may just want to stop and call it quits and end the cycle here, and that's a possibility. So now we can just like do the input. Okay, so we keep two pointers representing the current nodes we have, start them in negative one. And we get P1 is equal to um, the current vertex. It's more like um, one yeah so we start off here and here and then the total amount is the number of vertices we already have which is just the size of the last chain 
then we start here uh, and there's at least two which is nice I don't know what I just opened but <laughs> hopefully that's not a problem um, so I equals n minus 2 then we say so p1 is equal to a um, n minus 1 do we even need the pointer section? Actually, because we're going to assume that the pointers are always on the ends anyway, so I don't think we actually need the pointers. Um, so we say tau plus equals 2, because first we need to consider the benefit that we get from taking these. And then we say that we could possibly end the cycle here, um, so let's see. Oh wait, actually we want to do it this way. So if AI is greater than BI, then swap them. Because we don't really care if they're like inter... We don't really care if they're crossing. We just sort of like want them to... Um, We just want the larger one and the smaller one because the smaller one's automatically going to go towards the one and the larger one's going to go towards the, the end. That's something we already know. So if AI is less than BI, swap AI and BI, then, um, then we consider taking this cycle, which is, for example, this is three and this is one. So the um, additional nodes we get is three minus one minus one. So it's like bi minus ai minus 1. Then if ai is equal to bi, then we have to cut the cycle short. Because we know that, like, shoot. We know from here that, like, um, for example, Both of these, both of these lead to the same vertex, meaning that were we taking, if we were to continue the cycle, it would be impossible. We would, we would just hit the same vertex, and that means our path to be done. So if AI is equal to BI, then um, we already considered taking the cycle that ends here with the the case for the answer. So what we do now is we say. Um, that we kind of reset. So toad is equal to c of i. Or actually, c of i minus 1. Because we start, <coughs> if we're here, then we start at this chain. And then we start at the endpoints. Can't draw it all. Yeah. Otherwise, um, Otherwise, say we somehow end up like, for example, here, and then we're coming into this. Then we need to move this up, meaning that we get AI minus one extra nodes. And we need to move this down, meaning that we get CI minus BI extra nodes. So tote plus equals Oh yeah, ci minus 1 minus bi. And that's it. We have multi-tests? Yeah, we do. OK. Seven, eleven, seven. Um, where's the second test now? Oh wait, we may also want to consider, um, okay, that makes sense actually. If we end up here, it may be even better to just completely cut this short, like completely stop this cycle and instead start with the cycle that begins here, I guess. Yeah. So then we also consider, um, 
We also consider simply stopping and starting with the new cycle, I guess. That would be what that would be, I guess. Yeah. That's the other case. Because it may be optimal to do that even if we aren't forced to end the cycle. All right, seems legit, although I probably missed the case, but uh, you know, whatever. Let that happen when it happens. Just make sure the code is right. So for i equals m minus one, make sure ai is less than bi and consider ending the cycle here. Then if we're forced to end the cycle, do so. Otherwise, continue the current cycle, but also consider the case where we don't. Okay. Sounds good. Now for D, there are n plus one cities numbered from zero to n, and roads connect these cities. The ith road connects i minus one and i. Each road has a direction. The directions are given by a string of n characters. If n character, oh yeah, if the ith character is l, it means it goes from goes to the left. Otherwise, it goes to the right. Traveler would like to visit as many cities of this country as possible. Ensure they will start some city. Each day the traveler must go from the city to a neighboring city, and they can go along a road only if it's directed in the same direction they are going. Interesting. Okay, I guess this is the basic idea, um, what we're doing here. So, say we have two L's in a row here. Um, that's slightly bothering me. Say we have two L's in a row here, meaning that we have the graph like this. Then, um, I think this is sort of just a barrier. Say we end up going here. Then, um, yeah, so say we end up going here, then we want to go this way. But then we get this new graph that's like, um, bam, bam, because everything flips. So because of this, we'll never actually be able to get here because now we have to make this move. We have to make the move back because we can't go to the left. And um, that sort of screws us over. Um, so let's see. Then how does this work? So it's sort of like we have these barriers where we have multiple things in a row. So we can't have any multiple things in a row. Um, what we can do is, say for example, we also get this sort of stupid configuration where everything's just blocking us in. Then that just means we're screwed. There's nothing we can do about that. Now, another thing to note is that um, there's like there's some sort of parity stuff going on. Like, if we start at an even vertex, then every other even vertex we visit will have the same configuration, and every other odd vertex we visit will have the same configuration. Um, Also means that we should always be able to go back the way we came, I think. Is that how that works? So like, for example, so we have this, and we have this, and we have this, and we have this. So we go here and it flips, meaning that we can go back. 
Or we go here and it flips, meaning that we can go back. Yeah, and then if we ever want to go back, it'll flip again, so it'll make it work. So if we can ever get anywhere, then we can also always get back. Which also means that, like, we're really just trying to figure out how far can we go to the right, and how far can we go to the left, and then sum that up. And basically, for a given point, I think it's just this. We have this split point in the middle, which is the city we start at. Then we're interested in the longest alternating sequence, which is to say we want r, and then l, and then r, and then l, and then r, and then l, and etc. Because if we ever have two r's in a row, then we hit the configuration above where we can't go any further. And if we hit two l's in a row, then again we can't go any further. Because it's because of the parity that makes it be this way. Because every move we have to switch parity. And that means that whenever we get to a vertex, its parity will always be the same. So if we can't go somewhere in the first time we visit a vertex, we will never be able to go there. Just because of the way that the parity sort of controls everything. And so on the left side, we want the longest sequence of L, L, and then R, and then L, and then R, and then dot, dot, dot. So this, I guess, can be done with DP. And I suppose that does it. So it's kind of weird the way this works. Um, I guess so we would do sort of a sweep over the input. Let's say we have L, R, 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 L, L. We also have a stronger sample like L, R, L, R, 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 L, R, L, something like that. Um, I'll use that as a sample too. And in fact, let's do that now before I forget. Nine. What do we have? So L, R, Basically, my idea is that we're going to first do this for um, odd parities, I guess. So we started this barrier. We ask, do we have an L here? And if so, do we have an R here? And if so, Actually, wait. Now we're going. We're going to the right. So we start here, and then we say, "Do we have an R here? And if so, do we have an L here? And if not, then the best we can do here is zero. And then whatever we can do here. Let's say, for example, that this was an L. Then the best we can do here is if both of these match, then we can continue the sequence from here, and otherwise we can't. So it's kind of a bit weird the way we do it. We assume that, I guess we start by assuming that we want something like this. We have R and then L and then R and then L and then R and then L. And um, then it's kind of like, we can't consider these characters because the sequence is sort of inverted. So in our first sweep, we only consider the characters that are at like even or that are like odd positions or something. And then the next sweep, where we're looking for the string R and then L and then R and then L and then R and then L, meaning that we can now consider the other parity. I guess that's how this works.
Um, and then we do the same thing for the left, and then we just like do it. Yeah. So let's see, CN2, we get the, we do get the length of the string. N to S. So then we'll say A, A is the thing on the left, the best we can do on the left, and then B is the best we can do on the right. This is just my notation. And then the answer is the, and the answer is 1 plus ai plus bi. Because again, when we can go somewhere, we can always go back. So we're just sort of going left and right and seeing how it goes. Now let's do it for, oh, so I'm forgetting what c was. What was c? I don't know why this. Oh yeah, that one. OK, that kind of weird one. So this iteration trick is sort of figuring out the parity that we're currently working with. Um, so let's see, first we go to n. So now we need to figure out the character that we want. If we're starting by looking for this configuration, then when we're here, um, we need this to be an L, unless we're flipping it, in which case we need to be an R. So if we're at a character with an odd position, we need L unless we're flipped. So it's sort of like um, the, the parity of I. And then we can sort of XOR that with the parity of the with the fact that we're flipping or not. And then that's the character that we need. Um, and then we can figure out the character we need. Um, so if either we're flipped or we're at an odd position, then we need R. Otherwise, if either neither of them or both, then we need L. So if um, s i is equal to rec c, then at the same time, we need to figure out that we're at the right parity. So if i mod 2 is equal to the iteration, then a i plus 1 is equal to run. Actually, first we can update the run value. So if we have the character, then we're good. Otherwise, we cut the sequence short, so we have to like completely stop. And then we sort of do the same thing, but backwards for um, going the other way. So we're going to sort of say, like, for example, if we're not flipped, then the string we need is starting from the right. We go R, L, R, L, etc. Meaning that the two conditions are that either we're, that we're flipped, possibly, and that um, the parity of the current character is equal to the parity of n minus 1. So bool p is equal to n minus 1 mod 2. 
then the current condition is if our parity is equal to that and if we're flipping it out. Then if we're equal to that and we're not flipped, then the requirement is R. Because we need an R to the right. Yeah, okay. So then if I mod 2 is equal to If the fact that we're equal to the parity is not equal to the iteration, <laughs> this is weird. Um, Cause if we're not flipped, then we do want it to be equal to the parity because we're like doing it like this. And if not, then we don't want it to be. Um, yeah. It's the basic idea. print the answer. So 132 through 132, 1414. Now let's see, this is the more interesting case. Um, so when we're here, the answer we're getting is, so when we start here, the answer we get is 1, that's correct. When we start here, the answer we get is 4, that's correct. When we start here, the answer we get is 1, correct. When we get here, the answer we get is 4, correct. When we start here, we can go 1 to the left and 3 to the right, meaning we get 5. When we start here, we can't go anywhere. When we start here, we can go 3 left and 1 right. So that's 5. Here we can get 2, here we can get 2, here we can get 1. Seems good. Yeah, so we're messing with these dangerous conditions. Again, if we're here, then we're looking for an L only if either we're at an we're at a position with even parity, starting from zero index, or we're flipped. Or either it's like either we're both flipped and odd parity, or we're at even parity and not flipped. And then if either one of those are true but not the other, then we look for R. And then we say that I'm, we want I mod 2 to be equal to the iteration because, um, actually wait, let me just take the same case but make it 8 instead so that I can make sure it still works. And indeed it does. And so when we're here, we want the parity to either be equal to the last one or it be flipped. And it not be flipped. And then that gives us R. And otherwise, if either one of those are true, then we get L. Okay, this is whack. This is very whack. But I think it works, and I'm not sure. It's likely that it works. So be it. OK, a bit slow on that one. Maybe I sort of messed up the implementation, or people just like rushed into it. But whatever, that's how it be. There might actually be something easier. I think you can maybe, it might be possible to look for like the longest alternating sequence. Like you split things into groups by alternating sequence, and then figure out based on the way groups work, like, um, figure out like how far you can get from each position, I guess, based on if it's in a group and if so, like what works.
but whatever. Now we have a string problem, and that's fun. You're given n patterns p1 to pn and m strings s1 to sm. Each pattern pi consists of k characters that are either lowercase Latin letters or wildcard characters. Oh boy. All patterns are pairwise distinct. Each string sj consists of k lowercase Latin letters. Um, a string A matches a pattern B if... If it like if it fits, either it's a wild card or it works. You're asked to rearrange in the pattern. You're asked to rearrange the patterns in such a way that the first pattern the J string matches is P M T J. You are allowed to leave the order of the patterns unchanged. Can you perform such a rearrangement? If you can, then print any valid order. The first pattern the J string matches is P M T J. That's kind of interesting. Um, all right, wait. So if we go from left to right, then we sort of have this sort of like um, requirement that we have. First pattern the J string matches is P M T J. I have to leave the order of the patterns unchanged. <coughs> Why M T? What does that even mean? So A, B, C, D, and four. How does this work? A, B, B, C, D. Wait, 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 what? The first pattern the J string matches is P, M, T, J. Wait, so. Oh. Oh, it's a specific string. It's not okay. Okay. I'm weird. Uh, I, I. How did I do that? How did I mess that up? Okay. So. Okay, something of note is that there are only um, something of note. There are only f 27 to the fourth patterns. Um, specifically, every character can be either A to Z or an underscore. And 27 to the fourth is should be relatively small. Yeah, 500,000, okay. Specifically fitting k equals four. And for every string, um, for any string, like a, b, c, d, or 27 to the k, I guess, but like four, because k 
like it's it's exponential so we don't really care about the smaller values so then the ones that can match are um, 2 to the k possible ones the ones that can exactly match are 2 to the k possible ones and exactly match meaning that the underscores must also be equal to the underscores and it's 2 to the k because each character can either be changed to an underscore or unchanged So then inside this graph, for each string we get, does it guarantee that the J string even matches them? A, B, B, A must match with that, D, B, C, B, okay, I see. So inside this graph, we basically get that, um, When we have a condition that some string, for example, say we have that, say we have A, B, C, D, meaning that, say we have A, B, C, D, and we say the first thing it has to match is something like, what's the sample say? So it's A, B, underscore, underscore. That means the A, B, underscore, underscore must come before anything else that matches A, B, C, D. So for example, Let's take some of the things that do match A, B, C, D. Let's say A, B, C, D itself, or A underscore C underscore, or A underscore underscore D, or underscore 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 underscore, right? Then we say that because this has to be before everything else, this has to come before this, this has to come before this, this has to come before this, and this has to come before this. Now, there are at most 2 to the k minus 1 such relations for a single constraint because there are only two to the k strings that we're interested in. So if we create this massive directed graph where the nodes are all of the possible pattern strings we could have, then we basically just want any ordering that um, We basically just want any ordering that satisfies um, what we want. Let's see. There's a sample where it doesn't match, right? Like for example, underscore C. Yeah, OK. Right, so then we just need to find some ordering such that like all of the orderings are matched. We need to find some ordering of the vertices. And the way we can do that is by trying to find a topological sort, I guess. So if we have some invalid condition, then that means that the topological sort will be invalid. And yeah. And the fact that we're sort of working with a sparse graph doesn't matter. Because if we have some cycle in the graph, like a node only gets an outgoing edge if it directly appears in the input, meaning that if we have some cycle, we can guarantee that it's not some like phantom cycle that's kind of like weird. And um, like when we have an edge adjacent to some node, or we have an edge coming out from some node, we know that this node is in the input, meaning it has to be part of the permutation. So any cycle will be composed of only nodes that are in the input and have to be part of a constraint. Meaning that if we have a cycle, there are there's some constraint of the input that we can't satisfy, meaning that it's impossible. And otherwise, this directly gives us a um, a possible thing we can do. So it just works. So let's do it then. Um, right. Okay. So first, I'm going to create a hash function. Um, String s. I have underscores be zeros, and otherwise, actually, I have underscores be twenty six. Which have be zeros because that makes it easier to debug, and everything else is um, c minus a plus one. So then we get the hash. And then a to z, 1 to 26. 
So the numbers are at most 27. So um, toad equals zero, cur equals one. Toad plus equals cur times, and then cur times equals 27. It's like a polynomial hash, basically, just on this short string. And that makes it so we can um, 27 to the fourth, right? Yeah. Just use a million because why not? Let's just test this. So of these inputs, the first should be zero, the second should be um, the largest number possible, the third should be some random number, the fourth should be seven twenty nine. Oh, what I do? And I know there are not multi tests. Okay, it's kind of nice of them to do that because we have a graph problem. Actually, it would kind of be hard for them to have multi-tests. What? Oh, because I don't, yeah. That's, that's slightly important to actually have a return value for a function. No, I didn't even give the input. Okay, so O531440, which is what we expect. The third is that, the fourth is 730, that's right. And the fifth should be B times Okay, looks good. And actually, wait, just to make sure. 27 to the O plus 27 to the 1 plus 27 to the 2 plus 27 to the 3. Yep. I don't know why I'm checking that. It sort of makes sense that that would work, but whatever. Okay, so last time I tried doing a hashing problem, I screwed this up. But this works because the strings are at most length 4. There are no characters we don't care about. Because I remember I got hacked on the last edgy because of a stupid hashing mistake I made. But this should work. It should work. Don't see why it wouldn't work. Therefore, it must work. <laughs> That's a perfect proof. So then at is basically just for each um, for each possible hash, what are the indices that it has? Or for each possible string, what indices have that string? That'll help us with the topological ordering. So this is some bitwise magic. I'm iterating over the mask such that um, I'm iterating over the mask here where, for example, if we have this mask, like a bit mask of four elements, then the, the ones in the mask tell us which, which um, elements to make underscores. So for example, if I do this, then this would become A underscore B underscore, or no, C underscore. Um, and then, um, 
x. Actually, wait. You can have like um, so we're going to generate all the strings. Then canned j is equal to t. So then um, actually, do we do we care about the strings? I guess we only really care about the hashes. So g hash t. Then, um, yeah, because we want exact matching, because we're generating all the underscores anyway, so we don't care about that. So um, if canned i is equal to sh, then match is equal to um, canned i. If match is equal to negative one, then we automatically know that there is no answer because this, like, we can't satisfy it because there's nothing that it matches. Actually, wait, this doesn't make sense. Um, no, what we're doing is we're saying, um, Oh yeah, right, 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 right. What we need is the hash of the target string, which is the index. Um, so this would be st of x minus one, because zero index. <clears throat> yeah, we need the hash of the target string. We need to see if any of this fits the pattern of the target string. And if not, then automatically we're done, because we know that like we can't match the target string. And otherwise, then we need to add a directed edge between this. So edges sh dot push back because now we know that we need to um, yeah we need to do that. We also do the in degrees. So it just sh dot push back canned i means sh has to come before canned i in our ordering. And now we just do a top of sort and be done. Uh, plus plus id canned i. So then. Um, And we figure out the order of the number we need. So if id i is equal to zero, standard top of sort stuff, then q dot push id i while not q dot empty. Q dot front. Um, yeah. Vivid. Okay, now for L O Y edges X.
Actually, first I guess we can um, also, we need to check if there's an invalid cycle. And to do that, we see if inside the topological sort, there is a point, there is an edge from x to y where x is greater than y. That would only happen if there is an, if there's a cycle. So, tp equals zero. So then, um, ord. So then, ord x equals the current pointer. Oh wait, um, perm. Should I call it ants? Because why not? So then, four. For each part of the input that we have, um, and stop push back y in any order. Are these strings unique? Patterns are pairwise distinct. Okay, good. Otherwise, that would be really annoying. So actually, these don't have to be vectors, but you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. I can just have them be a single element. So for each element of the edges, um, minus minus their in degree, if their in degree is equal to zero, then q dot push one. So if we haven't visited all vertices, then we have some cycle. And actually, I think that's a stronger condition. If we if, if we have vertices we haven't visited, then at some point there's a point where all vertices don't have in degree zero, meaning there has to be at least one cycle. So then if all vertices are not visited, then we have a cycle. That might actually just be it. Because if we don't have a cycle, then we'll visit all vertices, because that means it's a DAG. And if we do have a cycle, then we won't visit all vertices. So maybe we just don't need this ordering at all. I think that kind of just does it, yeah. I want to remember how this works. Uh, that's not helpful. I don't. I, I'm, I usually don't trust geeks for geeks, but I just want to confirm my idea. Do it. Do I need the topological order? Okay, actually, whatever. I'll do it to be safe because I don't want to be hacked or something. So, um, because my ideas are not the strongest right now. If ord i is greater than ord j, then that means we have, we violate our condition. And if also we haven't visited every vertex, then it means that. Um, it's invalid. And otherwise, then our answer should have everything. We should also print yes. All right, let's see. No compilation errors. That is always a good thing. What is s dot length? Where do I have that? All oh, right, the hash function. Doesn't print an answer. What? Oh, is it because I have no? I do not have multi tests. What? It's just not printing an answer. Um. Like it doesn't get anywhere. Oh, wait. Get to the point of being here. What am, I, what am I? What am I doing? Why is this dying? Oh.
Uh. Oh, <laughs> whoops. Uh, yeah, that's important also. Okay, two, three, four, five, one. Um, how does that work? So three is untouched, one is untouched, meaning we don't care about those, so that's fine. Move no, and we should have no. Okay, let's check everything. First, the character hash does exactly what we want. The string hash does exactly what we want. I think we tested those both. Um, yep, so n, m, k, values are at most 10 to the fifth. So for i up to n, um, hash it. For i up to m, I'm reading the values. And so this is like 25 times 2 to the 4th times 4. Yeah, that's fine. I only have two seconds. So reading the values, then figure out all the possible things it can match with, and then say that The string that it's forced to match with, match with has to come before every other string that it has. Then we say, yeah, this is the hash of the target string. So if it matches with anything, then set it to that. And if not, then um, this actually isn't necessary at all. Well, it just needs to not be a negative one, so that's fine. If it's equal to that, then we do that. Otherwise, we can't. If it has no matches at all, then there's nothing we can do anyway. So then we construct the answer with the topological sort. We say um, push all vertices within degree 0. Then do this. Visit a node. If it corresponds to some input, put into the answer. Then visit all corresponding vertices that now have in degree 0 once we remove this one. If we never visit all vertices, it means we should have a cycle. If something violates the topological order, we should have a cycle. I think I'll test this later, just to see. Um, kind of interested now. But if we have something that violates topological order, meaning that we have an edge from a higher node to a lesser node, that means we also have a cycle. And um, that does it. Let's find out if it works. Running on test 10, running on test 16, running on test 22. It's a lot of tests. It's a good thing. Don't want to be hacked. Seems legit. OK, so f and g are both unsolved, meaning that um, that's a fun thing to do. I guess g is the next target, then. Yeah, again, we're a bit slow. That's fine. Demoralizer. Um, OK, let's see. So is G getting more saws as we speak? No, it's not. All right, let's see. So you're given an integer array A of size n, and you have to perform m queries. Each query has one of two types, 1 LRK. Calculate the minimum value diff such that there are k distinct integers such that, what? Such that um, count i is greater than 0. So there are k distinct integers that are on the array and that So it's the maximum difference between the most frequent and the least frequent, I guess. Or the minimum difference, yeah. And if there are not k distinct elements, then be done. All right, that's weird. Minimum value 
negative such that there are exist k distinct integers such that count i is greater than zero and count i minus count j is less than diff. Also read f just to see. There are n lanterns in a row. The lantern i is placed in position i and has power equal to pi. Each lantern can be directed to illuminate either some lanterns to the left or some lanterns to the right. If the ith lantern is turned to the left, it illuminates all lanterns j such that j is within pi. And it's, yeah. The goal is to choose a direction for each lantern so that each lantern is illuminated by at least one other lantern or report that it is impossible. Interesting. So if pi is zero, that's that's sort of the hard part, I guess. Because if everything is one, then it can. If everything is one. How does that work actually? So every lantern can't illuminate itself, meaning that um, we need something to illuminate the leftmost lantern. That's kind of whack. Okay, I would guess G is more approachable, maybe. So let's look at that one. So I'm not sure. It's like hard. <laughs> Both of them are hard. That's the thing. Has anyone solved diff yet? I'm just checking the dashboard at this point. Okay, not more people are solving G or F or G or H. I oh, yeah, and other people have better penalties than me because they were faster on the earlier problems, I guess. Interesting. One minute apart. What else did I do? I forgot what the other problems were. Oh yeah, that one took a while because I misread it. That one took a while. Actually, that one took a while because I was explaining it, and so did this one. Kind of spent more time explaining it than actually doing it. This one... Um, I don't even know. That one was weird. That one was kind of hard to explain, I think. And then this one is, yeah, a thing. So, minimum difference, you're given an integer array A of size N, you have to perform M queries. Right, 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 right. So let's see, if there aren't enough distinct integers, then we're done. Um, so this seems like Mo's algorithm. No, yeah, it has updates, so it has updates. OK. Shoot, I didn't even realize that. OK, that's hard then. How do we handle distinct integers with updates? There exists k distinct integers, such that count i is greater than 0. And there exists an interval 
of length k, where there are k possible frequencies on that interval. So the thing to note there are most square root n different frequencies, which is interesting. Uh, it means if we have the frequencies in some sort of array, we can do two pointers on it. The problem is how do we put the frequencies in some sort of array? And um, So of note, at any point in the sequence, there are like at every at all points, there are at most square root n elements that can take a frequency larger than square root n, which is also something of note. So for the large elements, perhaps perhaps we do some brute force with prefix sums, and for the smaller elements, that's sort of what we're interested in. Smaller elements are harder. But sort of like we want the number of elements that only appear once, and we want the number of elements that only appear twice, and etc. If this is some sort of persistent segment tree, I'm going to be mad. Although the updates also kind of make it weird. Elements are up to 10 to the fifth. I don't think that matters because we can compress them anyway. Um, I guess this is going to be my final boss. Yeah, there are three people that have solved this. Maybe we can be the fourth. Who knows? So we can solve it if we have a frequency array. Can we generate a frequency array? Or a frequency array over the frequencies? How do we do this? So to count the number of elements with a one frequency. And it sort of has to be online because we have updates. Merging with a segment tree. Wait, 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 wait. Is that just it? Are we really just supposed to do this? No, 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 no. Merging with a segment tree will not work because um, 
handling the elements is kind of weird, I think. Also, that constant is going to be terrible. But we do have five seconds. So, so say we were to merge with a segment tree. What would that even mean? We're merging two frequencies array, frequency arrays of frequencies of size at most square root n. How do we do it without brute force? I'm not sure if that's possible. I think it's too many. And we have to do it in sublinear time. We have to do it in square root n time. And I'm not sure if that's possible. F of t on merge. Oh my god, no. That, that won't even work. So never mind. That's not a thing we should think about ever. But perhaps there is something we can think about. I'm just not sure what it is. Has my place gone down anymore? Okay, 59th. So I guess unless more people start solving F or G, that'll be my final rank, which I guess I'm fine with. Could have been faster, but um, that was not the intent. The intent was for this to be educational, and that means sabotaging my own rank sometimes. So that's fine. Um, K distinct integers where count i is greater than zero. Mm -hmm. How do we do this? Is this just something we're supposed to do? Queries L I R I can be grouped into at most n over n to the two thirds squared equals n to the two third blocks. For each block, deal with query operations which belong to this block and all update operations. So queries L I R I can be grouped into at most n over n to the two thirds squared into the two thirds block. The CP algorithms have it. What is this? Deal with query operations which belong to this block and all update operations. I think this assumes some sort of quick operation. The problem is merging merging the arrays we have is too hard. Is there a subarray starting at the learning on the fly? That's what edgy rounds are for, right? Yeah. So consider a subarray starting at the end of blocks at block X and adding it ending at the end of block Y. Or starting at the start, yeah. Can pre compute. 
Yeah, update in L1 time for a subarray. This will take N to the two thirds time for update. Okay, that doesn't work here because we're merging subarrays of length square root n. How does this work? Watching a video during a video is probably not going to work out since we have 20 minutes left. So, does this work? This just seems like some sort of weird square root decomposition with, um, I don't know why we don't just do normal square root with that. It's n root n. Oh, right, because an update is bad. Okay. The thing about Mohs algorithm is that it handles special things. This is just sort of weird. Oh wait, maybe maybe that's what we do need to do. This is why you learn things beforehand.
anything better on this? They're doing something that's kind of annoying. Decompose a random block size s. Insert queries that ask for some sum, firstly based on the block which i lies in, and secondly. By, finally, second line by the block that r lies in, and finally by t. Oh, is that how that works? Oh, that might be how it works. So if you sort by T, then you also get... Um, Sort by T, then inside a pair of blocks, of which they're at most. Okay, I guess that works. All right, sure. Should we try to implement this? I guess it can't hurt. I mean, it might actually be doable. And try and clutch this out. Um. Okay. So. Scene to end to M. Um. Should, does this have a log? If it has a log, we're screwed. Can we get rid of the log somehow? Yeah, if it has a log, we're screwed. Um, so answering a query is easier, I guess. Count i is the number of occurrences of x i in the separate a l i. How do we handle the frequencies? We can't have a log. N to the 5 thirds times log will not cut it. That's basically n squared at that point. do this not slowly. <laughs> we can get the array of frequencies, but we need like a weird array of frequencies.
idea. I'll explain it later. Let's see if we can do this. Um, no, wait, no. Hello, pair, hello, hello. Vectors. Okay, now Sort. Let's approximate the cube root of that. Um, fifty square, twenty five hundred. Okay.
No way I'm going to implement this in time, but I guess I'll try to do it afterwards because this, I'm, I'm fairly sure this is at least passable complexity. It's like n root n. It's like, <laughs> I don't even know. It's n root n log n plus n to the 5 thirds, which is like terrible. So maybe not. But I'm, I'm fairly sure this is, this has the chance of working if it's optimized enough, but there's no way I can implement it in eight minutes. But I'll try nonetheless. So um, while LV is less than, so LV and RV are inclusive. So while LV is less than the, um, lock equals i dot s. So lock dot f del lv minus minus lock dot f while lv is greater than or equal to no greater than lock dot f Minus minus LV. No oh, wait. Plus plus LV. RV is greater than lock dot F. Del RV. Six minutes, okay. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Um, wait. So while Let's have point B exclusive. Or no, have point B inclusive. So while um, where I dot what is it? So f dot f while point is less than. First, T is greater than or equal to that, then do the update. Plus plus point. Um,
this. Um, what is exclusive.f? And at this point, we solved the query. But yeah, I'm not going to be able to implement this. So in total, this should be n root n. And the candidate array is what makes it so we can store the frequencies while being smart about it. So I think that, or not n root n, n, n to the 5 thirds. And the candidate array is the final step that took me too long to see. So from here, we can do two pointers and solve things. Um, I'm going to explain all of that, and yeah, I'm surprised that, I'm guessing people are getting T on G, is that what the verdict is? Seems very tight. Oh, wrong answer. So T Le, T Le, T Le, some GMs are T Yeah, that makes sense. 1294, okay, maybe there's a better way than what I'm doing, but Rainboy did it in three seconds, almost four seconds. So who knows? Let's see how people are doing. <coughs> yeah, solving G seems like the move. Um, if only I wasn't so slow. Because it could, it might have been possible to do that. Did you get TLE? I'm sure he did. No, wrong answer. Okay. Using Kotlin would not be the best for this sort of thing, I would imagine. What the hell is Constitute doing? Um, Alright, so I suppose I will go over the solutions I have. And I'll go over G, and then if it happens to work, I'll put it in the title, and if not, I'll leave it out. Because the, my ID for G is very likely to TLE, and it will be very likely to be difficult to make pass, but it's possible, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm optimistic, because it's possible. It's like 2500N plus um, something else. It's like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, what is it? So 4100 times 25 plus 25 times 300 times, um, it's more like 600 times log 2 of 25. Oh God, eh, it's really close. It's gonna be really close. Uh, it's like, I guess the square root n log n dominates the complexity in terms of time, but you know, constant factors and stuff. So we have five seconds. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. In any case, yeah, I'll finish implementing later and I will uh, talk about it. So let's begin with solutions um, for everything. You're given two integers n and k. You should create an array of n positive integers such that their sum is divisible by k and it minimizes the maximum element in A. All right, so we need to create an element, we need to create an array. Let's see, not use spaces, or not use commas. We need to create an array such that the sum of AI is equal to K, or the sum of AI is divisible by K, meaning the sum of AI mod K is equal to zero, and it minimizes the maximum element. So imagine we want exactly x. Oh, and also every element must be strictly greater than 0. OK. Um, for all i, a i is greater than 0. That's just what that means. So let's say we wanted exactly x, meaning that we might get rid of this condition for a second. Um, Then the way to maximize the minimum, the way to minimize the maximum element is to make the elements as close as possible. And the way to do that is to have it be, let the quantity y be, um, 
x mod n. And then let the quantity z be um, the floor of x divided by n. So then if we have the array z, 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 then the sum we get is x times x over n, which is essentially the smallest integer such that um, The smallest integer that's, or the largest integer that's let, the largest integer multiple of n that's less than x, or less than or equal to. So if we take the quantity x minus this, or actually no, this should be n because every element we have n of these, yeah. So if we take the quantity x minus this, then we get x mod n, meaning that like. Meaning that like we're we have the we're very close to the answer, we just we're missing part of it. And um, let's see, this part this equation is true because that's sort of like it's kind of the way mod works. To compute a mod, you can first find the number, you can find the floor division, and then. It's like the, the it's like the amount you're higher than the floor division. Because the floor division is the largest multiple of n that's like less than or equal to x. Right, I think it's better to try and work it out, I guess. But that equation is true. And then um so from there it means we're like that's that's our error. We need to add this much more to the array. And the way we can do that is we have this element y. And so for y elements, we can add 1. And that way, we get, we get exactly n times x over n plus y, which if we solve for that is equal to x. So we have um, basically n minus y elements that are equal to z. And the remaining y elements are equal to z plus 1. And by this equation, this will sum exactly to x. So that's the strategy. And for that, the maximum element will be equal to, um, well, if y is 0, then that means that the largest element is z. And if y is greater than 0, then that means that the largest element is equal to z plus 1. And this happens to coincide with, this happens, this just happens to coincide with the ceiling of x over n. Because if it's exactly divisible, then we get exactly x over n, and otherwise we get one more. That's sort of what the ceiling function is. So, um, so the answer for a given x and a given n is the ceiling of x over n. That's sort of what I've been trying to get at. Now the problem is, we don't know what x is. But clearly, as we increase x, our answer is going to be larger, which means we want the smallest possible x that still satisfies the um, equation. And that means that because we're using positive integers, every value must be greater than 1. So every, gra every value must be at least 1, meaning that, no, wait. Every value must be greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1, meaning that the sum of ai must be greater than or equal to n. And if this is true, then that means that because we make the elements as close as possible, every element's going to be 1 in our construction if we do it like this. So that will work. And essentially, so we want the smallest multiple of k that's greater than or equal to n. And this is like, this is the definition of the ceiling function right here. This is what we want. So the optimal value for x is simply the value of the ceiling of n over k. And then for that value of x, the answer is the value of the ceiling for x over n. 
So in code, I just do that. You find the x to be the ceiling of n over k, which is um, a trick you can do is to the ceiling of a over b is equal to the floor division of a plus b minus 1 over b. I will not prove that because it's sort of like it's just casework basically. If it's exactly divisible, of course it works. And if not, then um, then you can show that it'll always work out everywhere else. So actually, it's not of course it works. It's that this doesn't exceed the next like multiple of b, meaning that it doesn't add to the answer if this is exactly divisible. And if it's not exactly divisible, then it should add to the answer by 1, and it does. So that's, that's how you would prove this. But anyway, that's just an implementation trick. You can do other ways of getting the ceiling, too. Um, but the reason floor division is nice is because um, most languages automatically use that, meaning that it's um, easy to make it do that. That's a lot of notes for an A. That's kind of whack. OK, so now for B. And B, I took a long time on because I misread it initially. So that was fun. Um, you have you have a bunch of changes. Um, for example, their sample is 20100. 1, 2, 0, 2, 2, 0, 2. And you have an integer k. And what you want to do is make it so um, you want to satisfy the following condition that for every i, for every i greater than or equal to 1, That does not look like a greater than or equal sign. That doesn't look like anything. It looks like a 2. I don't know what that is. For every i greater than or equal to 1, um, we want that pi, and the array is called p, over the sum of all of the previous values of p. So i equals 0 to, um, all right, now, j equals 0 to i minus 1 of pj is less than or equal to k over 100. That's, that's our constraint, and we want to make this true. And what we can do is simply increase the values of pi. All right, so first, if we play with the equation a bit, we get that what we need is that um, if we, if we like cross multiply it, we get that the sum from j equals 0 to, to i minus 1 of pj must be greater than or equal to 100 times pi over k. Right, so note that we can only increase pi, meaning that if we increase pi, it's going to make this inequality harder to satisfy. And we can only increase this, but increasing it makes it easier to satisfy. So that's what we want to do. We want to increase the prefix sum, so all the previous values. Also, this is this should be i minus 1, not i equals 1. Um, that was a mistake. So also notice that because i is greater than or equal to 1, that means that p0 is sort of unaccounted for. And note that increasing p0 will increase the prefix sum for everything before it, but at the same time not increase any of the other p values, which means it's going to be as easy as possible for the other ones. Because it's going to increase all of the prefix sums at the same time, while also not making it any harder by messing with the other side of it. And if we increase any other value 
pi where i is greater than 0, then it's going to it's going to increase some of the prefix sums, but not the prefix sums that are before it. And also, it's going to increase this value, which makes it harder. Meaning that it's going to be strictly worse to um, increase a value that's not 0, meaning that the only thing we care about is making it 0. So really, that's it. We, we're going to increase p0 by some amount to satisfy all possible conditions. And um, basically, to do that, we need to increase this value to some x, where x is greater than 100 times pi over k, which is, again, the definition of the ceiling function, I think. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but I think, I think that's how they define it. It's the greatest integer that's like a multiple. It's the greatest integer such that x times k is greater than this. So x is the ceiling of this, which is, again, the floor of um, the floor of 100 times pi. And I'm only making it the ceiling because I don't like, um, because everything has to be integers anyway, because um, you can only increase by discrete values. You can only increase by integers. So. Uh, yeah, that's the basic idea. So the value you need to increase this to is um, the value you need to increase this to is this value x, which is this, meaning that this this will take at most x minus the sum of pj um, operations, and then the answer is just the maximum of all of these because again, increasing p zero will increase all of these simultaneously. So we only need the worst case individual one. And also make sure that the answer isn't less than 0, because automatically, yeah. So it would be the maximum of this and 0 for that operation. So let me just take the maximum of these quantities. So like the code ends up being very simple. We just find the requirement, the value x, and then take the answer as the maximum of all of those. In fact, it's not even necessary to do that here, but you know, whatever. And then we maintain the sum as we go along, so like a prefix sum. But I, I'm not, are the constraints? The constraints are tiny, so it doesn't even matter. You don't need the prefix sum, but you can maintain it as you go along. So then that gives you O of n. Um, okay. So that makes things work. Let's go for C now. C is weird. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna copy this diagram because this is like nice. So it's like actually perfect. So um, I think it misses one case, but like. So the basic idea is you construct a graph, and the way you construct this graph is, you start with a bunch of chains where each chain is just like a line of length of some length. So for example, this is a line of length three. This is a line of like four, this is three, and this is three, and these values are given as integers in the input. And your your goal is to find the largest simple cycle in this graph. Um, yeah, that's the goal. How do you do that, though? And so... Um, Essentially, the way this graph is created is for every i that's for every element that's not the first one, you pick some, you pick some vertex on this chain and link it to the first vertex on the next chain. And actually, it's more like yeah, you pick some you pick some vertex on this chain and link it to the first vertex in the next chain, and you pick some vertex pick some vertex on this and link it to the first and link it to the last one in the next one, and you do this for all of them. And um, you want to find the longest simple cycle in this graph, which means it visits 
It's a loop, and it doesn't visit any vertex more than once. So basically the idea is the cycle, the cycle that we get is kind of predetermined from the ending location and the starting location. And what I'm saying is the endpoints of the cycle, or like not the end, well, yeah. Um, how, how do I put this, the properties? Also the cycle lengths are 10 to the ninth, so we cannot construct this graph in any way. Um, or the chain links are 10 to the ninth. So the way we would do this is by sort of, we can sweep from right to left or left to right or however you want. And we say that we're going to start the cycle on this chain and then sort of just go to the, to, to the left and see how far we can get. So we start like this, and then we assume that we have everything in between. So then, the only thing we can do to continue the cycle is to move on to the next part. And um, now we have this partial cycle of length 5. Now there are two things we can do at this point. We can cut the cycle short, or we can... Um, we can cut the cycle short, or we can um, continue on the cycle by moving to these endpoints and then going over here and continuing. Both of these are possibilities. So we first consider the answer that we get from cutting off this cycle, which is the current length we maintain plus the um, number of nodes between the two nodes that we're currently at. And, um, If we, if, we, if we manipulate the values so that um, AI is the smaller one, because we don't really care the actual, um, we don't really care which is which, because it doesn't matter if you link it to the first or the end, we just care which one is larger and smaller. And then the length is the current total that you have plus BI minus AI minus one. That's just the distance, the number of nodes between these two um, vertices. And this is a plus sign. Right, so that gives us that. So now what we need to do is we can also continue on the cycle. And we can continue on the cycle only if these two aren't the same. Because if they are the same, like for example here, then no matter what we do, we're already going to have duplicate vertices. Like we can't continue the cycle without having to go back to this vertex. And that means that it would not be a cycle. It would not be a simple cycle. And yeah, so that is interesting. How would that work? What we need to do is we need to like, well, yeah. So like that's that's when we can't finish the cycle. I got kind of sidetracked there. But um, so when we do extend the cycle, then we're basically going to make it so we, we move the smaller one to the one and we move the larger one to the end meaning that we get like AI minus one plus CI minus one, like the, the next cycle length. Um, or it's more like AI plus one, which is the, um, it's like the, it's like this, sorry. It's this minus this and like this minus the endpoint, or the endpoint minus that node. So the indexing is kind of weird because of the way they formulate the problem, but it, it's something like this. That's how much you get from moving down, 
and then we continue the cycle and yeah and there's also um, we add one for every endpoint that we stick in so the cases are we start at the end initially and then we go through and we either we either cut the cycle short here meaning that we connect the two endpoints that we just came at and that's a possible answer or we continue the cycle by moving down to the endpoints only if they don't intersect at the same point and there's also the case where we stop here and instead make the cycle where we for example start at these endpoints and then start with this cycle which may be more optimal so that's another case we would consider and notice that this ends up considering all possible ending positions because we consider them sort of in our sweep so we consider all possible ending positions, and we also consider all possible starting positions. And we can show that the cycle will correspond to some subarray of the, the, cycle, or the chains. Because like every, every chain is only connected to the adjacent chains, meaning we can't have this and this, but not this one. So you just sort of sweep across, compute the um, actual lengths carefully, and um, sort of go with it. So here, first of all, make sure AI is less than BI, and then consider the answer where we cut off the cycle here. Then if the two are the same, we're forced to start a new cycle. Otherwise, we consider both the cases of starting a new cycle and continuing our current one by moving to the endpoints and continuing. And then the answer is just the answer. So yeah, that does things. Now we move on to D, where we um, let's see. <clears throat> so D is fundamentally a kind of weird statement. We have a graph of length n plus 1, where, um, what do we have? So we have L, R, 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 L. We have a string that consists of left and right. And from this string, we create a graph where the edge, like the first edge corresponds to the first letter, the second corresponds to the second letter, and so on. And the edge points left if it's an L, and it points right if the letters in R. So for example, this graph would be this. I believe they give a diagram. No, they don't. Nice. Um, yeah. So this goes here. And we're going to start on some vertex and move around this graph. And um, The way we move around this graph is we can take an edge only if um, it's pointing in the right direction. Like we can't go this way because it's not pointing this way. It's pointing this way. Um, and by right, I mean correct direction, like corresponding to where we would go, not to the right. So um, yeah, although the catch is for every um, vertex we move, like for every vertex we move, um, the entire graph like switches. So after we move one, then every left will become right and every right will become left. So we get this sort of opposite graph. Um, and all the letters will be flipped and whatnot. So we get the string R, L, 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 R, R. And then every time we move again, the, the, the letters flip again. So we're basically asking, for a single starting point, how many distinct vertices can we visit? 
So the key, the sort of key idea here, idea here is that um, everything is dependent on parity. When we visit a node, because like every two moves, it reverts to the original graph. I mean, that if we visit, if we visit a node at an even unit of time, then it will, um, it will have the original graph. And if we visit a node at an odd unit of time, it will have the tr the opposite graph. And because every move flips the parity of the node we're at, as well as the parity of time, um, we're always going to visit a node at the same parity no matter what. So for example, the starting node will always be even. These two nodes will always be even, and the other nodes will always be odd. Because there's no path from a node to itself of odd length, because we can only go left or right. And another thing about parity that's nice is if we can go somewhere, then we can go back because um, then we can go back because whatever edges we took to get here, when we go back, will be at the will be at the opposite parity. Like for example, if we if we go to the right, and then we end up here and then we want to go back, then we'll be at the opposite parity that we were at when we were here, meaning that this edge to the right will now be an edge to the left, so we can take it. Because now we're at a node of opposite parity. So what that basically means is we can always retrace our steps. Because again, the parity of the node is always constant, or the parity of the time at a specific node is always constant. So this proof extends to like multiple um, edges of this argument. That being said, now all we need to do is figure out how far we can get to the left and how far we can get to the right. So to get to the left, we need the first edge to be pointing to the left, the second edge to be pointing to the right, the third edge to be pointing to the left, and etc. We need this alternating string. And to go to the right, we need the same thing. Because we need, we need we need like the first vertex, the first edge to be R, then the second edge to be L so that it gets flipped into R, then the third to be R again, then the fourth to be L so it gets flipped into R, and etc. And because we can always go back, the left and right are kind of independent of each other, meaning that now we just need to find the longest alternating sequence to the left and the longest to the right for every node, and that would be our answer. So there are like a lot of ways to do this. I, I did a sort of complicated way that's a bit weird. We basically do it for odd and even separately. Like we basically, we assume we want the string LR, 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 LR. LR, et cetera. And then we figure out like for each point the um, the longest like s like so the longest string that ends here that we can get. So for example, if we have the string um, l l r r l r l l something like that, then this only works for one character. This works for none. This works for none. This works for one. This works for two, because there are two characters that match ending at this point. This works for three, this works for four, and this works for one. But the key is that only we only care about half of these, the one that the ones that like end on an L, because the ones that end on an R, we don't want those. We want L and then R and then L and then R and then etc. So we can do this with a very simple like DP approach. If it's the same then it's whatever the answer is for the previous one. And if it's not the same, then the answer is zero, because no matter what, it ends at a bad character. So we can sort of generate this array where it's like one if um, the, it's like one if they're, they match and zero if not. And then we want the longest sequence of ones that ends at this um, point. 
So yeah, either we extend the previous sequence if this is a one, or we the answer is immediately zero otherwise. So it's like either um, like a i minus one plus one if s i is equal to one, or zero if s i is equal to zero. Yeah, so that gives us that. And then again, we only consider it for um, the strings that actually have an L in them. So we only consider it for this ending point. We only consider it for this ending point, and this ending point, and this ending point, and this one. Because for the other ones, they'll begin with an R, and that's not what we want. And then we do the same thing for the opposite string. We do R, L, R, L, R, L, R, L. And then that gives us the answer for the ones at odd indices. And then we can do the same thing um, going to the, this gives, us, this gives us the left answer. We do the same thing for the right answer. So it's sort of like four cases, but we can mash them together a bit. And then from there, the answer is one, because we can automatically visit this, plus we can say, for example, li is the, the amount we can go to the left, plus the amount we can go to the right. Let's call that ri. And that basically does it. So the hardest part is computing these values. And the code is sort of based on the cases. Um, I recommend, if you want to see how the code works, see the screencast, because I sort of go through what I'm doing. So you can see my, my process of writing the code in the screencast itself, which would make it easier. For E, this is kind of a weird one. Would 27 to the fifth pass? Would they uh, be kind of close? So probably not. <coughs> okay, so we have a bunch of patterns. So let's see. I'll copy the sample. We have a bunch of patterns, um, like for example, blank B, blank D, blank, 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 B, blank, A, 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 B, blank, blank, and blank B, C, D. Kind of, I can't, I can't write. Um, yeah, and then with this, what we want, so a string will satisfy the pattern if either the pattern is blank so the blank means it accepts any character, and a specific character means it has to be this one. So for example, to satisfy um, A, B, blank, blank, something like A, B, A, A would work because the A can match, the A's match with the blank because anything matches with the blank. And so we can make it be anything. We can make A, B, C, D, A, B, Z, Z, et cetera. But if the specific characters don't match, C doesn't match with B, so it doesn't work even if the other characters do match. So we also have a set of input strings, which are um, A, B, C, D, A, B, B, A, and D, B, C, D. So every character, every string will match with some amount of the patterns. For example, this one matches with this one. Um, this one and this one. This one matches with this one and this one. And this one matches with um, another color. Color that's distinct from them. Yeah, brown works, I guess. And this one works. This one matches with this one and this one. It's kind of messy. So, um,. So we want to reorder these elements. So we give them their initial um, values. And then we want to reorder them in such a way that, that makes us happy. And the way to make us happy is each of these values also has a number. For example, this has 4, 2, and 5. And we want to reorder it so that um, for this, Oh, 
like for this value of all the of all the patterns that match this string um, we want to we want this specific one to come before everything else so of all the patterns that match with this one this one must be the first so four must come before one and four must come before five and then um, This is actually simpler than I thought. I'm not sure what I was doing. Um, but we do the same thing for the second one. We say that 2 must come before everything else. So 2 must come before 4 in this case. And we say that in here, um, for example, this 5, this must come before everything else too. So the 5 must come before the 1. So we have the constraints, for example, here, that 4 must come before 1. And um, let's see. So p4 is less than p1. And 4 must come before 5. God, why can't I draw? Oh my god, what is happening? And. Uh, P, let's see, so we have that 2 must come before 4 as well, and that 1 must come before 5. No, 5 must come before 1. Yeah. So then we want to find an ordering that satisfies these relations. So I, I kind of overcomplicated this in my code, actually. Although it's not really overcomplicated, I just did it a different way. But the easiest way to think about it is, um, we have these series of constraints. So basically, for every string that this matches, um, we say that the, the target string must come before all of them. And if if this doesn't match anything, if this doesn't match this string, then like it, it just it's never gonna work because it can't be the earliest string that it matches if it doesn't even match. So first we check if this matches with this, and if not, then it's invalid. For we check that for all of them, and then otherwise, now we can create these relations. Now, one thing we can do is to make a graph out of these relations. So, if these are one, two, three, three, four, and five, then we have that four must come before one, so let's add an edge from four to one. 4 must come before 5, so it's at an edge from 4 to 5. 2 must come before 4, and 5 must come before 1. This is like a common thing to do in these sort of relations. And then the problem reduces to finding a topological sort on this graph. And if no topological sort exists, that means we have a cycle. And if we have a cycle in our relations, then that's that means it's invalid no matter what, because um, like we're saying that everything has to be greater than the next element in the cycle. Meaning that like the last element in the cycle has to be greater than the first one, but also less than it by some sort of like transitive relations. Like for example, here, if we have this cycle, then we have that, we have that one must be greater than two, which must be greater than three, which must be greater than four. So by transitivity, 1 must be greater than 4, but then we also have the constraint that 4 must be greater than 1, or rather, 1 must be less than 4. And of course, this is impossible. So if we have a cycle, there's no answer. And otherwise, there does exist the topological sort, meaning that there will be no edge from a greater element to a lower element, meaning that all of the constraints will be satisfied. So if we can find a if we can construct this graph and then find a topological sort on it, then that gives us our answer. Now the question is how to construct this graph because we can't go. <coughs> I, we can't go through all of the strings and say that. Um, we can't go through all the strings. And say that if it matches, then construct the edge because there are too many strings. We can't have O of n m. That's too much. But notice that the, the weird thing to note immediately as you read this problem, you got to notice the small numbers. k is at most 
4. So, like, what the hell does 4 mean? Well, basically, um, what we can do is consider some string A, B, C, D. What patterns can it match with? It can match with either itself or anything where some of the some of the characters are blank. For example, A blank blank D. But like, how many patterns can it actually match with? Every character can either be unchanged, or it can be a blank, independent of each uh, independent of each other. Meaning that every character has two possibilities. So then we get two to the fourth or two to the k total possibilities for any given string of the patterns it can match with. I mean, if we think about it this way, for a given string, which patterns does it match with and what indices do they have? Where are they in the input, if they are in the input at all? Then this, this means we only have two to the fourth things to process for every, um, for every constraint that we have. And that's much easier. And it also means that we have at most two to the, or two to the k minus one possible um, like edges for every um, for every value or for every constraint that we get. So really we just iterate through these strings. We iterate through the strings that can be generated by either um, keeping the string keeping the character the same or replacing it with an underscore. And we can do that just by like um, using a bit mask where bit mask is one if it'll be replaced and zero otherwise. And then we see if it's in the input. And if so, then we can just um, and if so, then we look at all of the other strings that are possible, and then we say if those strings are in the input, then we add an edge from the, the thing corresponding to the input to the index of that other string that we get. So for example, if we determine that, um, let's say, for example, we focus on this constraint, we have that a, b, blank, blank, must be greater than um, blank B, blank D, and it must be greater than blank B, C, D. <coughs> so what I did, I, what I did in my own solution is just like make a, um, a graph out of these, where each of these strings are nodes, because there are only 27 to the fourth possible nodes, because every character can be either one of the 26 letters or an underscore. In fact, if we had uppercase, would it still work? Yeah, it would still work. But anyway, I made that graph and then did the topological sort on that. Or you can simply convert these to indices. We can say this is index 4, this is index 2, this is index 5, and just find the reverse of the indices based on the strings. And then say that 4 must be greater than 2, and 4 must be greater than 5, and do it that way. Either way works. Then just do a topological sort and be done. And that gives you the ordering you want. Okay, I will make I will make a very brief attempt to explain my idea for G. <coughs> mm. This is gonna be fun. Okay, so um, statement's weird. I'm gonna be brief about it, so I will not explain the statement. If you are at this point and you need the solution for G, I trust that you can <laughs> read. Hopefully. Um, try not to misread it. That's also a good thing. So basically, the strategy is we're going to do Mo's algorithm with updates. And I spent most of the time on my screencast figuring out, looking up how this works, which means I didn't have enough time to implement it. So I didn't solve G, but I'll try and do it afterwards and see if it works. And Mo's algorithm with updates, we basically figure out. Um, Like we want a, we want an array of frequencies for each element. So for example, say we have the array two, one, two, two, three, two, one. Oh no. Then we say that one has two occurrences, two has two occurrence, 
two has three, two has four occurrences. And actually, I'll stick a four here too. Um, three has one occurrence, and four has one occurrence. But what we're sort of more interested in is sort of like an array of frequencies of the frequencies. So we say that frequency one shows up twice. I'll use a different color, actually. Frequency one shows up twice. Frequency two shows up one time. Frequency three shows up no times. And frequency four shows up one time. Because <coughs> we basically want we want a value x. And then we constrain that all of the frequencies that we're interested in, the ones that are going to satisfy the answer and be part of our array, are going to be on the interval of some value y up to some value y plus x. If the answer is x, then all of, the, all of our candidate values can be constrained within this interval. And if some endpoint of the interval is not covered, then we can shrink it. So then say we had this array of array of frequencies, or this array of frequencies of frequencies. What we kind of want to do now is get it in this format. We want it to be in the format of like frequency of frequency of element pair and the, um, or it's like, Frequency mapping to the frequency of that frequency. And then we have these as pairs. And then for everything that's 0, we don't have them. Because then using this interval, we can do two pointers over this, um, over this array to solve it, to solve for the answer. And this works because, <coughs> because the sum of these frequencies is at most n. Because there are most n possible um, elements, then there are most n different frequencies that are non-zero, meaning that the sum of these values is n. Or the sum of the frequencies we have is n. Meaning that in this array of frequencies of frequencies, there are at most, there are at most O of root n distinct values. <clears throat> So this array will be of length at most O of root n, meaning that our two pointers will work. <coughs> so this will be rather simple with Mo's algorithm. The problem is that we also have updates. So we just like do Mo's algorithm with updates, which is something you can look up. Uh, the Code Forces blog, reading through the comments of the blog is, not, is good enough. So for Mo's algorithm with updates, we want to do that. And we're basically going to say what happens. Um, we want that. <coughs> we want to generate both of these arrays. So Mo's algorithm with updates will basically it'll take O of n to the 5 thirds. And we can basically just maintain these arrays as we go along and sweep through queries and handle updates and things. So that works. Um, now the question is, how do we get this array? <coughs> and the basic idea that I had is that while we do these updates, when we update an element, we store a list of every possible frequency that we've ever encountered. So for example, here we would have encountered 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then say I, um, then say I stick on another 2 into the original array, meaning that now we get to the frequency of 5. So now I would add a 5 into this array because we've seen the frequency 5. And then, um, yeah, and then once we do that, <clears throat> and then even if we remove this two, we still keep five in this array. Because even though we don't have five before, we've seen it. 
and removing the five would be too costly to do for every update. We're trying to not have n to the five thirds times log of n because that will never pass. That's like basically n squared. So um, yeah, what we want to do from there is that. Then we're going to, with this frequency array, when we get to the point of a query, also note that the total length of this array will be at most O of n to the 5 thirds because every change we do adds at most one element to this array. Then when we do that, every time we get to a query, we prune this array down to length square root n again because, again, we're only interested in the distinct frequencies. So this in total will take O of n to the 5 thirds plus n root n because we sort of have to prune this array down to b of length root n again. And then in fact, we all so and then it'll take like root n per query to do the pruning kind of because at, at the end of every query, this array can still be of length root n. Like basically we prune the array to only have the frequencies that we actually have, which we can ex check explicitly. And then I guess the way we can remove duplicates is by um, using a visited array, which means that using like a timestamped visited array, sort of that type of, th type of thing, or like a map, which adds a log factor, which is ugly, but <coughs> that's how we do it, I guess. And then using this array, using this pruned array, this basically tells us exactly what we want. We want... Um, Actually, we might have to sort. That might be obligatory. I think at some point we have to sort. So we have to sort this eventually. Meaning that we also get an n like root n times log n factor. But the log n is sorting, so it's not terrible. Um, and then once we sort, we can do two pointers on this array and be happy. So that's the basic idea. I think this this frequency array, this like this sort of like scene array where we sort of prune it later might be the hardest part, getting rid of the log factor on this. But that's the that's my idea. So in total, this complexity is n to the five thirds plus n root n root of n log n. Which of course is terrible. But the fact that n is 10 to the fifth and we have five seconds, it sort of gives me the idea that this, this might be intended, or something like this, or just maybe some sort of n root n log n. <clears throat> but this is the best I have. I have, not I have not finished implementing it yet. I will try to soon and um, see what I can do. Oh, and by the way, we can do the pruning just by checking like if this frequency shows up at all, and if not, we just get rid of it. And then later on, we can sort and do unique values and stuff like that. Yeah, so... Um... Because <clears throat> we want this to be distinct values, because these are going to be the, the first indices of our pairs, the frequencies themselves. Yeah, so... Uh... Magic complexity, put some stars around it maybe. Some disgusting stars because I can't draw for the life of me. Um, I don't know, I'm having fun here. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's my idea for G. I will submit this and confirm it in the description slash a pinned comment when I figure it out or when I figure out if it's correct or not. But uh, yeah, that's my contest. So I guess we will see how this works later on. Have there been hacks already? Have there been hacks on B? Am I going to be hacked? Oh, A if A has been hacked. How, how would A's be hacked? Um, all right, that seems like the kind of thing that would happen to me. So maybe we'll be hacked, maybe not. I don't know. But 
I guess that's all I have for now. So yeah, once again, I'll update you guys on G when I figure it out. Other than that, that's all I have. So I uh, hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.